Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're here to worship. And I love what Pastor Tim Keller from Presbyterian Redeemer Church in New York said. He said, everyone worships something. The only choice you get is what to worship. Everyone worships something. The only choice you get is what to worship. Now, we're in our series. We're ending our series here on Christmas with this last message today, and it is the series called Why Jesus Came. And the first week we talked about he is uh, the light and hope in our dark world. Last week we talked about he is salvation from our sins. And today, tonight, I want to talk to you how he is here to reign in us forever. Now, where would I get that from? Well, not just from scripture, but a song, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. There's a line in there that says this, Born to reign in us forever. Now, what would that mean? It would mean that he would have to come and dwell in us, and then he would have to rule and reign in our lives, and we would worship him and let him reign and lead us through this life. That's what it means to let him reign. And the result of Jesus reigning in our hearts is a life, not just here on earth, but eternity of worshiping him and living for him. You see, Christmas is, it goes beyond some of the things on the surface in the Bible. Christmas goes deeper. And I believe that Jesus came to restore and reclaim our hearts so that our worship will go in the right direction again, and that is the direction of God. In order to restore the direction of our worship, he needed to come and reclaim our hearts and to save them. And God is love and longs for us to be in a love relationship with him. He isn't looking for robotic worship. He is looking for hearts that will adore and love him. And we're meant to praise. We're meant to glorify him and worship God out of love. Why? Because he first loved us so we can love him. And in the world, even back then when Jesus was born and even today, hearts are still not beating for him. They're not living for him because they've been corrupted by sin and focused elsewhere. But when Jesus came to earth, he began to captivate the hearts of mankind again. This is what the Christmas story in the Bible is all about. Jesus coming to restore that relationship that was broken because of sin. And it really started to spread from Bethlehem with a group of shepherds. Now, before I continue, we're going to be in uh, Luke 2. If you want to turn in your Bibles, we'll have it on the screen as well. Luke chapter 2. But before we get there, I just want you to know what worship is. To worship God is to give him the worth and the credit that he deserves as our creator. And we can do that by the way we live, the songs that we sing like we did tonight and we'll sing again at the end here. It's obedience. It could be through uh, obe obeying the word, giving to God. Anything he asks us to do in scripture and we do it, it's to worship him. We can worship him in our hearts and our minds and with our actions. And I believe Jesus came to fix and restore all of that so we would be in a relationship that loves and worships God. And again, it began with shepherds. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, the birth of Jesus. At the time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiance, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now that night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. 
Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Now, why would the angel make sure he says that? Well, the shepherds were so used to looking at sheep and especially lambs, and they would place them in a manger and inspect them and make sure that they were without blot or blemish and perfect lambs for sacrificing. And so they were used to seeing and looking at a lamb inside of a feeding trough covered with uh, cloth so that it wouldn't hurt its limbs if, as it's kind of swaying around and fighting them. And so they would wrap them tightly and then they would inspect the lamb. And so the angel and God knew that the way to get them to understand that this is Jesus is they would find a baby wrapped in an animal trough, a manger. And that was why that was so important. Now suddenly in verse 13, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, of other angels called the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now, it was custom in this time in, in Palestine that when a baby, especially a boy, were to be born, the friends in the community and the musicians would all gather outside the house to wait and hear the news of the baby's birth. And, of course, when the news came out, all of a sudden they started like pretty much a marching band. <laughs> and they started singing and celebrating, and this reception took place, and there was great joy in the city for one baby being born. Now, this night, there was no reception or procession or anything, no celebration for Jesus at this place because he wasn't in the traditional home. It's most likely that Jesus was born in an animal stable, primarily be on a bottom level of their homes, was where animals would stay at night, or some scholars believe it was in the side of a hillside of Bethlehem in a cave where animals would stay. And the point being is, is that there was no one around to celebrate Jesus, but that wouldn't stop heaven from worshiping Jesus. What happens next is the angels, they come and they show up, and they begin to glorify Jesus in front of shepherds. And then a host of angels, not just one, we think it's Gabriel, but a host of angels comes and begins to worship. Now, what's interesting about this is God chooses to reveal and to worship for the first time Jesus in front of shepherds. Why shepherds? They're the lowly, humble ones that are never around. They're the last ones to hear the news in the city. They're never part of the in-the-know crowd. They're the last ones to find out anything good that's happening in Bethlehem because they're always out in the fields. And God chooses them to reveal his glory and begin to worship. Now what happens is next is the shepherds are astonished by these angels. They go and they look for this lamb or this baby in a manger and find him. And now they are caught with and, and captivated with wonder and worship. And they go around telling everyone everything they have seen. The night that Jesus was born, I want you to think about this for a moment. He is so great and he's so worthy of our songs and our lives and our worship that the night he was born, not just earth worshiped, but heaven worshiped. That's an important person, would you say so? The night and that night teaches us that if humanity doesn't worship him, if there is no reception outside 
his place, this stable. If humanity doesn't worship Jesus, at least all of heaven will. And when humanity doesn't recognize Jesus' worth, God is so gracious that he comes to us by sending us messengers like angels or maybe a person in your life who told you about Jesus and got your attention. He will send someone to you to captivate your heart, open your eyes to see him again, and he's still doing it today. If we don't look for him, he's so gracious, he comes looking for you and for us. Why? Because he loves you. He wants to be in relationship with you. And once you're in a relationship with him, you can't help but worship and tell everyone about him. You can't help but talk about his name. That night, lastly, teaches us that a heart captivated by Jesus will overflow with worship to God. My prayer tonight is that you are captivated by the love of God. I, my prayer this Christmas season is that he gets a hold of your attention and you're just in awe and wonder of his love and his majesty and that you would worship Jesus. Now, it wasn't just the lowly, humble shepherds that worshiped him. It was also the wise and the wealthy magi and the wise men. If you turn to your Bibles in Matthew 2, we'll be there for our text for the rest of this message. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. And we're going to see what happens when the wise men come and see Jesus. Verse 1 says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. So notice, the star rises and is in the air when he is born. And this is why they've come to worship him. They had a sign. Now, magi are astrologers, and they're very wise, and they've studied many different topics, and they have a ton of knowledge. And because they see this unique star, they came to visit and to see what it's all about. And King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone else in Jerusalem. Now, why would King Herod be disturbed? Because King Herod doesn't want a rival. He doesn't want a king to rival him. And here's the reason why. Because that position usually belongs to the Jews. And he wasn't a Jew. He was appointed by the Roman um, Empire to be there instead. And he wasn't completely a Jew. And so he's concerned that now this ruler that everyone's talking about, and now people from afar are traveling to see and worship, well, it's going to kick him out of his position. He goes on to say this. Um, Herod said this, he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. This is Micah 5.2. This is hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called up for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. And we all know that that's not what he really wanted to do. King Herod's plan was to get rid of Jesus once he found out where he was. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem now, you ready for this? I'm not a scientist, and I'm not an astrologist, but this seems supernatural. It says here, it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. Unless it was a shooting star, this star was moving to lead and guide the wise men to know where to go. Now, that's important. I'll say in a moment why. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Now keep in mind, 
that this is not the same night as the shepherds. He was a child, approximately one to two years old. They had traveled months, miles, to come see this Jesus. And the star remained in the sky to help guide them the entire way. And when they got there, they couldn't help but get down in a posture of worship where they bowed down and they began to worship. We don't know what they said, but just their act of bowing down is to give reverence and awe to the king of kings. But they didn't stop there. They began to open up their gifts and give frankincense, gold, and myrrh, precious gifts, unique gifts that meant many different things that I won't go into this Christmas, but they were special gifts for different occasions in, pur- in people's lives, even royalty, representing royalty and, and his position as king. And they gave these precious gifts as an act of worship. See, we can worship by traveling afar, by spending time to even be here tonight, by being here on, on your weekly services and, and being in your Bible and prayer and, and being in, in small groups or fellowships You can worship God wherever you are, but they decide to travel hundreds of miles in months to show their worship to Jesus. And then when they get there, they give gifts, another form of worship. I have up here, this really really touched me and blessed me. I have up here one of our offering envelopes. And by the way, uh, Dorothy said she forgot to mention for our church people that, that if you're going to give this weekend, it's at the end of our service. That's kind of funny. I have this up here as a reminder. But our giving is at the end as you walk out or online. But a young girl, 10 years old, gave this to my wife and I this week. She said God put it on her heart to give all that she had to the church, to give it to God. Children shall lead the way. Amen. And I want Michaela to know we're going to do good with this, as always. We want to help those in need with these this twenty dollars. How cute is that during Christmas time? So neat. The Magi they traveled afar. Why? Well, because Jesus is worth the trip. Jesus is worth being here tonight. Jesus is worth celebrating and having family over and and getting gifts for people and practicing what the wise men did as well. And Jesus is worth loving your neighbor as yourself. He's he's worth our our gifts, whether they're large or small. It doesn't matter. He's worth it. But I have I have a big feeling after reading the whole Bible that that you're worth coming all the way from heaven to earth. That at the same time, God wants you to know you're worth traveling that far. That you're worth going to the cross and dying and then rising again and and telling you the truth, you're worth that much. Just in case you didn't know, you're worth Jesus dying on the cross for you. The King of Kings, the one that all heaven and earth worshiped, he gave up his life for you because you're worth it. You're that important to God. Is that not a reason to thank God right now for a moment? Can we just praise God and give him a hand? And thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Why does that bless me to think about? Because my sin, your sin, didn't keep God from coming here and saving us. It doesn't matter position or status or wealth. As you can see, shepherds and magi are here, and God has come to save all of us, and we are here to worship him, to be in relationship with him. Nothing stops God from loving you. He loves you that much. When I think about what God says, how Jesus came to earth because we were worth the trip, I think about his grace and mercy. And this is what the grace and mercy of God looks like. When the weary world didn't look up, God came down so we would see him. When we weren't looking for him, he came to us so we could see him. Many kings and rulers have come and gone, ruled and died. 
but only Jesus reigns and lives forever. Jesus has no rivals. I want you to know that. There is no one who can compete with Jesus. He belongs in your heart. He belongs in your life. He belongs on your mouth, your lips. It's why he came is to be in relationship with you and to change your life and for you to experience a love so great you can't help but telling everyone about him and going to your grave worshiping him. The only time there's a rival is if we try to put one next to him in our life. And the thing is, even that will pass and fade away too. And I learned from this story of the wise men, the wise worship God and no one else. Let that sink in. The wise worship God. Let that get in your heart and no one else. It was the wise who found Jesus and worshiped him. So let me close with this. How do we worship God? What can we give him? I wanna encourage you to offer your life because it's the only thing we can possibly give back to God is your life. Jesus gave up his, and so now I give up mine to show God how much I love him. When I was 12 years old, I gave God the reins to my heart so he could steer me in the direction I need to go. I told God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll be whoever you want me to be. And let me tell you, that was, that was not easy to say. But at 12 years old, I was so overwhelmed by the message I heard by my youth pastor. I was so overwhelmed by the love of the cross and what Jesus did for me that I said, God, take the reins, take control of my life. I follow you. Now, the second thing is, is I didn't really know him that well as much as I hoped so and, and needed to. So I started reading the Bible. And so one way we start worshiping God is we read the Bible. We get to know him so we know how to live for him. And that's the third thing I started doing. After I started getting, getting to know my creator and my savior, and I started to fall more in love with him, I started to trust him more and more. I began to do what his word says. I began to do what the Bible says to do. Because when we obey, it is worship. It's not just singing for a moment. It's not just singing during a holiday. It's a life of worship to God. That's what true worship is. Jesus didn't come for you to give a moment. He came to give, he came for you to give your life. Because he gave his entire life for you as well. So I began to obey, but I wanted to obey too. I wanted to obey Jesus because I fought, fell so in love with him and everything he's done for me, I couldn't help but do what he wants me to do. I'm not perfect at it. None of us are. But I choose Jesus every single day because he chose me. He chose to die for me. He chose to come to this earth for me. And now I live my life to serve God. I live my life to help everyone else know about God. Not just here in a pulpit, but at every moment in my life. I strive to help people see Jesus. So Jesus captured my attention. Then he got my heart. And now he has my whole life. I close with this. <clears throat> and by the way, your kids have been amazing. Get them extra cookies tonight. Or maybe not so you can sleep. What can we possibly give God of the universe, the King of Kings? What can we possibly give him? accept our life. And it begins here. This Christmas, tonight, give up the reins of your heart. Don't try to control your life. Let God lead the way. Let God direct your path through his word. Let him make your life what he wants it to be. Choose to give your heart to him and he'll get your whole life not just at church, not just at Christmas Eve or Easter, but choose tonight, choose tomorrow, especially tomorrow. Choose on Saturday and Sunday to live for God. You're worth the trip. He's worth your life, amen? He's worth your life. <clears throat> Start with a simple prayer. 
I give you my heart, Jesus. I give you my life. Change me. Lead me. Mold me into who you want me to be. We're getting ready to do our candles. And I'm going to pray at the end of our candlelight songs. But if in this moment, as we're singing, would you let these last two songs be an act of worship? I know we already have, but intentionally begin to worship him and say, I give you my life. Not just this moment, I give you my life.